All right, let's go ahead and jump in. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Scott Gobi. I'm a marketing coordinator here at Telguard. Today, we're going to discuss the five steps to a successful 2G, 3G, and CDMA sunset strategy. Our presenter today is Mr. Daniel Rosales. Daniel has over a decade of experience in the industry. He's been with Telguard for previous technology sunsets before. He's picked up a few tricks and tips along the way that he'd like to share with you today to make the road a little easier. If you have a question along the way, uh, we have a questions bar in our webinar platform. Just type that in and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass it over to Mr. Daniel Rosales. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, hi, everybody. So um, I just wanted to first um, start off by setting a little bit of expectations, right? Um, so what we're going to learn here today is nothing new. It's nothing that you haven't heard or, or thought about before. Um, really, what we've done is we've taken uh, the experience that we've had. Telegard has been around since 1986. Um, so we have been through the analog sunset. We have been through the uh, 2G sunset. We have been through various changes in technology. So we are, in fact, the alarm communication experts. We've been through it all. We've, we've innovated in the space. We've been in it for such a long time. And we've gotten feedback from customers. Uh, we've gotten feedback on what works, what doesn't work, what we could do better on our side. We've implemented some of those things already. Um, and a lot of the steps that you will be looking at here as I'm presenting are really things that come from really a lot of it is just logical thinking, right? Um, as we move into a situation in which we're forced, essentially, forced to contact and reach out to customers and tell them that something needs to change, uh, we wanna make sure that we have a strategy in place, a, a plan of action. Um, now, it's not just about saying this is gonna happen and that's the way it is. It's really about understanding what it is that we're facing, planning for it, creating a strategy around it, and finally acting on it. Now, when we talk about the five steps uh, towards a successful strategy, we're really breaking it down in step one, understanding what the events are and what options you have. So first you gotta understand what a sunset is. You gotta understand how a sunset will happen, I guess as much as you can understand, um, and what options you have for replacing devices, what options you have uh, as, as far as how to tackle the events that are going to eventually occur. Step two, after you know what you have to face, you have to understand what you're equipped with and what you have to deal with. So understanding your labor capacity, how much extra work can you handle? Um, you know, we're all, we're all really in the business, uh, not just to provide security, you know, for, for our customers, but also to collect revenue, right? We're, we're, we're trying to grow our business. We're not trying to stay stuck with the 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 customers that we have. We wanna make sure that number keeps growing. So we wanna understand how much effort can I put into this on a weekly, monthly basis so that it doesn't interfere or impact my ability to grow the business with new customers, right? We wanna understand what our current population is in order to really strategize how many units, how many customers have to interact with on a monthly basis. We want to make sure that we plan to increase a perceived value. The concept of perceived value is something that um, everybody really knows what it is. We understand what it is, but we don't really talk about it too much um, un unless we're talking about a sales call, right? So I want to make sure that the concept of perceived value is something that is inherent in our strategy. We, we keep that thought process in mind at all times because when we make a phone call, we, we email somebody letting them know that, hey, this is going to happen. Um, it's a different approach as if we were to offer a brand new service or as if we got the call from somebody wanting a new service added to their portfolio. Step four is going to be planning the actual strategy. So we have all this information. We know what's going to happen. We know when it's going to happen. Uh, we know how much we can actually uh, uh, do as far as you know labor capacity. We know how many units we got to tackle. We know how to market the uh, uh, the solution or the transition in a way that it makes the customer feel a, a little bit better about it. Now let's get let's get to work. Let's let's figure out who do we contact first. How many people do we contact at first? Step five seems like the easiest, but it's probably a little bit tougher uh, to accept because 
it's not just acting on what you decided to do. It's also willing to adapt. There's a change in environment. There, there are things that will change along the way. There are things that you will try according to your plan that may not be as effective as you thought they would be. So you need to reassess, you need to act, shift strategies, switch uh, uh, communication paths, whatever, whatever it takes to make sure you start hitting your goals. So we're gonna talk about these five steps. The easiest way to convey the message, I guess, is to just follow along with an example. So we're gonna we're gonna think about uh, uh, just a, a small small business, a couple of people that do both installation and service at the same time. So there isn't like a dedicated team that only does service calls. Um, small office environment, three people taking care of the accounting and, and and answering phone calls and and reaching out to customers with new deals and everything. So it's a small company that we're dealing with. So when I give the examples, just keep that small company in mind. Um, for the examples as a case study. So step one is understanding the events and, and what options do you actually have? Um, number one thing is what is going to happen? So we all know the term sunset. We understand, at, at least we should understand if we have been in the business um, for a few years, the last sunset occurred at the end of 2016. So um, we're looking at an event that signifies the end of a technology. And, and I'm careful when I word it that way because the event that sign, signifies the end of it, it's basically, I'm basically meaning that we're getting to the finish line, but the race is already being run. So things are already changing. Things may already be changing in, in your area. And if they're not right now, they will eventually, but they will definitely happen. Something will occur before we get to the finish line, before that sunset date. So for AT&T, we have a 3G sunset date of February 22nd, 2022. For Verizon and the CDMA technology, we have a, a sunset date of December 31st, 2022. Um, now I get the question every once in a while, hey, what's the difference between 3G and CDMA? Um, just to put it in simple terms, AT&T and Verizon were essentially uh, running different technologies as they got into the new generation of technology. So um, one is based on, without getting overly overly wordy, uh, time division versus co-division of, of sending the, the signals. So AT&T basically said, okay, we're gonna go the SIM card route. We're gonna go, our 3G devices are gonna use the SIM card and this is the technology that we're gonna use. Now in 3G land, um, that GSM, that approach um, of using the SIM card, it was actually more globally accepted. So when you go to other countries, uh, if, you, if you travel internationally, in the last decade, most of the time you go to another country and they're, they're, they may sell you or they may rent out a, a SIM card for you to use. Um, and that's just because GSM, the technology that 3G that AT&T uses is based on that technology that uses a SIM card. CDMA is more of a homegrown US-based technology that doesn't require a SIM card. And that is a, a, the main physical difference. Um, they basically both connect to their cellular networks in different ways, but they achieve the same the same uh, the same concept. Um, as we move into 4G technology, as we moved into 4G technology, we finally see both carriers kind of coming in together and adopting um, the same technology. So we're seeing LTE being the prevalent uh, technology for most carriers. Now, if you, I, I guess if you paid attention maybe uh, several years ago, I'm gonna say maybe five, maybe, maybe even 10 years ago, um, WiMAX came into the picture. I think Sprint was the one that came up with WiMAX. Um, and it was their initial foray into 4G technologies. Now, it proved to not be what they were hoping for. So they basically switched over to LTE as well. So at this point in, in, in time, all the major carriers out there are essentially banking or using LTE technology as the 4G technology. And coming up, uh, we're actually also seeing carriers investing in their 5G technologies as well. So, so what does it mean? What does it mean to sunset? Um, get it back on track. Um, to sunset basically means you're ending the service uh, for that particular technology. What it really means though, for us in the industry and in the business is that we are going to see changes happening leading up to those dates. So frequency farming and bath bandwidth changes are two concepts that we will be impacted and affected by in a very real way 
And unfortunately, it's not something that you would get too much of a heads up on, right? So frequency farming, it, I think it's probably the easiest to illustrate. So imagine that you have frequencies that are shared both by 3G and LTE, kind of like uh, when you tune your radio to FM and you get to a different frequency to listen to a different radio station, you turn it up, to, uh, turn up the dial a little bit more and you get to a different frequency and you uh, listen to a different radio station. It's a similar concept where 3G and LTE happen to share frequencies. Well, what would happen when we start doing the farming or the refarming of the frequencies is, is that some of these frequencies that were allocated to both 3G and LTE will now just be allocated to LTE. So 3G will be out of the picture for those as far as support. So if you had a 3G unit that was using a specific frequency to connect to a tower that was nearby, it may no longer connect to that tower because that frequency is no longer available once refarming starts in that area. So what is that 3G unit left with? It's left with using the other frequencies that it has access to and it's left with reaching out to perhaps other towers that may not be as close um, or that may not have as good signal strength. So symptoms that you may see in the field are a unit that was perhaps working with three bars of signal strength, suddenly drop into one bar, or even, even worse, worst case scenarios, um, 3G units that were working beautifully, perfect, all of a sudden just start having constant signal failure issues, uh, constant drops in connections, and that is because they're having to reach out to different towers than what they were used to because frequencies are different. So I think that's one of the easiest uh, concepts to explain, the fact that some of these shared uh, frequencies are now gonna be reallocated exclusively to LTE. The end goal for the network is to eventually completely switch 3Gs off. And that is more or less the promise that we have that by December 31st on the Verizon side, 3G will be completely switched off and on AT&T by February, they'll be switched off. And you'll be left with a 3G device that will no longer connect to the network. Um, bandwidth changes is something that's very real as well. Um, and to really explain that concept, um, I kind of want you to put yourself in the, in the shoes of a business person, right? Um, so you're looking at AT&T, you're looking at Verizon as a business. And when you really start looking at um, the core of their customer, the customer base, it is primarily, I'm gonna say maybe 99% of it is primarily smartphones. Um, you know, tablets are, are pretty popular nowadays. Um, but you know, I would say that about 99% of their data consumption is from smartphones and tablets and those types of devices. And then there's the 1% that actually uses uh, what we call the IoT or the machine to machine devices, which are, you know, increasing in popularity but that's where Telguard and all the other communicators uh, fall in, the category that they fall in. So I'm a business, I'm at and I'm catering to my 99% because I know they actually use a heck of a lot more data, right? If you if you put it in terms of data, um, you know, one, one minute video clip on YouTube will probably consume as much as a Telguard unit uh, on a given month. Standard Telguard unit just using random self, you know, self tests on, on whatever frequency. So we're looking at big differences in data consumptions. So if I'm AT&T, if I'm a business, um, I need to cater to my customers that are gonna be consuming more data because consuming more data means more money in my pockets. So when it comes down to allocating resources, allocating bandwidth, uh, it suits me better as a carrier to give better access, better throughput, better speeds, better bandwidth access to those customers that are going to be using more data. So my smartphones or my tablets, I want to allocate more to those. Now, smartphones and tablets, they've been on LTE for a while now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, even though I may still have the same frequency available to both 3G and, and LTE, I'm going to go ahead and allocate more to my LTE guys. I'm going to go ahead and let them do more because they're going to give me higher revenue. They're going to consume more. And truth be told, which is another advantage of being on the LTE network, um, they are louder complainers. I know it, it sounds it sounds a little bit silly to think about, but if you're using your LTE phone and you're not getting service, there's a chance that you're gonna get home and complain to somebody, whether it's a forum, whether it's calling up somebody from a different phone and trying to figure out why you're not getting the speeds that you were promised, why your phone is not working. Well, those smartphones are going to be uh, connected to users that will actually complain, right? Uh, on the machine to machine side, unless the actual signal completely drops and it creates an issue 
they are not as big of complainers to the networks themselves. So an advantage also of going to LTE is the fact you're taking the power of all those uh, you know big data users, the, the iPhone and the Android users, so that if anything goes wrong in a particular area, um, it's not just your voice as, hey, yeah, I have a couple of different units in my in, in, in a couple of residences in this community that are complaining. Um, you have the power of every single person in that particular area being impacted and voicing their complaints. So issues on LTE tend to be catered to a lot faster than they would be on a 3G side. So uh, frequency farming is a very real thing. It's a very real um, impact prior to the sunset, leading up to the sunset that we expect to get more and more common uh, as we get closer to the sunset date. Uh, so in the US, we have AT&T and Verizon uh, with those particular sunsets. Um, in uh, Canada, we also have a uh, sunset. Now, Canada, as far as technology goes, um, they are on LTE. They, they, they're, they're basically on par uh, with the US when it comes to the, the, I guess, engaging and innovative on the technology side, but they're still supporting 2G units. Now, in the US, the 2G sunset occurred a few years ago, um, so we don't really have to deal with it. Uh, but just to kind of give you an example, uh, Ro uh, Rogers is actually uh, doing a, a pretty good thing as far as scheduling their sunsets. So they're basically told us that, hey, one of these frequencies is gonna cease to provide access to the 2G units by March 31st, 2021. And that second frequency that the 2G units only use to, uh, will cease to exist on December 31st, 2021, right? So it's a good example of how they're uh, scheduling the frequency farming ahead of time. And they're letting, you know, letting us know that it's gonna happen. So any units that are using 1900 megahertz in Canada and using the Rogers network will actually just stop communicating over that frequency. And if they can use the other frequency, they will pair up with another tower. If the other frequency is not good enough to penetrate the building, then they may be out of luck and they need to replace that sooner than later. So for Canada, um, I would take March 31st as the effective sunset um, the, to look out for for the 2G radios and December 31st would be more of a fallback. Whatever works after March 31st, I still need to get rid of them, need to transition them over um, by December 31st at the latest. But March 31st would be my effective sunset to make sure I transition those 2G units uh, over into LTE uh, as soon as possible. So we understand what's going to happen. We understand the meaning of the sunsets and, and what they actually are. But what options do I have? What options do I have to be able to tackle this, this event? Um, like I, I mentioned before, um, we are essentially reaching out to customers, letting them know. We are essentially providing the information. And Scott and his team have put together a very nice uh, sunset page uh, on telgar.com that may help you with the communication to the customers and sort of helping them understand what's happening. Uh, but we are still reaching out to customers. We are still reaching out, calling, and letting them know, hey, this is going to happen. This is going to have to happen. So what options do I have to minimize the cost on my end? What options do I have to minimize the uh, the headaches that come with transitioning something over it that technically it's not really going to bring you new or, or higher recurrent revenue unless you, know, you work it into your strategy, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit later. So what options do you have? Uh, from the Telgar side, for instance, we have on the commercial side, we have swappable boards. So instead of getting a whole new TG7 or a TG7 FS unit and having to replace the whole thing, which, you know, if you're in the commercial fire business, you know that it's it's not as easy to replace one of those units when you have, you know, rigid conduit running into it and you have wires and all of this. It's it's a lot more complicated. It's a lot more complex to do it. So what Telgar has done is basically replacing the parts that we know you don't have and that need replacement, right? So with a TG7 UBL, we know that if you have a Telgar unit already installed, you have the battery connector, you have the adapter already in place, you have the antenna cables that you need. What are the things that you're going to need to replace? Number one is the radio. So we're gonna give you the board. Number two, the antenna. So we're gonna give you the LTE antenna. By only giving you what you need, we're basically minimizing the hardware costs, we're minimizing the shipping costs, and we're just transferring those savings onto you as a consumer. We're also minimizing the labor costs, uh, particularly in commercial applications, because you don't have to remove the enclosure. All you have to do is 
go through a very, very basic installation, takes maybe 10, 15 minutes max uh, to remove the board and pop the new one in. Um, and also something that we sometimes oversee is the account history continuity, right? So when you replace a board on Telguard, um, you're keeping all the history that you have accrued with that account um, under the same subscriber. So we give you a, a very quick, very simple um, serial number replace option by which all the configuration changes and every uh, historical data that you have on a unit that was in that location when it was in a 3G uh, board, it automatically gets transferred over to the LTE board, to the new LTE board. And it just makes things a lot easier because it's almost as if you don't really have to think about what needs to be programmed because everything, if it was working before, it'll be working now just with an LTE um, technology. The last thing is, as far as options, you gotta make sure you take advantage of any cost savings opportunities, whether it's with Telgar, whether it's with any other vendors, uh, we know that the conversation is not gonna be easy. We know that the conversation with your customer is gonna be one in which you have to present them with an option that they have to take, right? If they wanna maintain cellular connectivity, they have to take. Um, and they're not really gaining much from it per se. So you gotta take advantage of opportunities. Just to give you an example, Telguard is currently doing a, a promotion, buy three, get one free on the TG1 Express units. So if, for instance, you're in the residential space and you know you have to change out at least four units, go ahead and buy them all at once. It'll give you, for all intents and purposes, a nice percentage savings on the units that you do purchase. So it's, it's a savings that you can either take on yourself or transfer to the customers or however your business model works. Uh, something else that Telguard is doing, for example, is we're doing home control flex free for three months with a new activation. And what this does is it basically allows you to offer three free months of remote service, which if the customer decides to keep, it's something that you can upcharge for, you can upsell for. So it, it gives you the opportunity to not just maintain that customer right and, and and keep them on the same on the same path of cellular connectivity but also upsell them on a new service um which makes you a little bit more money and brings them a little extra satisfaction of getting something for the effort of, of letting you into their house so we know what's going to happen we know that we have to understand what our vendors are offering what opportunities they're having on a month to month, quarter to quarter, talk to your distributors, figure out what's what's available out there, talk to your sales representatives. I always encourage that, especially if you have a big project or something coming up, or if you realize that, oh, I have this customer, I've had him for years, um, and uh, they have you know, 10, 20, 30 uh, locations. Uh, I own them all, um, or maybe I don't own them all, but I'm gonna go ahead and make a pitch. Hey, if I'm gonna do it for the 10 that I do own, let me go ahead and convert them all, right? Talk to your sales representative. Maybe there's an opportunity to, to do something there for you. Um, Telguard, uh, it, it, I truly believe, is one of those companies that's definitely willing to work with you on things. We understand where we are. We understand the situations that we're facing, and, and we're more than willing to work with you. So we know what the sunsets are. We know some of the tools that we have available to us, the sales and, and, and some of the devices. Now we need to understand what we can handle. Um, from a business perspective, putting our business hats back on, um, we want to make sure we continue to grow our business. We know that we're in it to make money. There's no kidding about that. We're in it to make monthly revenue. That's the name of the game, RMR. So we want to make sure that we continue to grow our business as much as we can. So we want to make sure that we know how much extra work we can handle that will not interfere with our current efforts to continue to grow the business, to continue to continue to sell new products, to continue to sell new services to new customers, right? And also understanding that it's not just about the physical installation. Physical installation, getting a technician out there, spending an hour or two of their time to do a couple of different uh, conversions in an area, it's not the biggest chunk of it. The biggest chunk of it is really getting a customer to agree to it, negotiating how that's going to be, when it's going to be. Customers postpone all the time. Hey, yeah, Monday works. They call you uh, on, leave you a voicemail on Saturday. Hey, Monday's not going to work. I, I got to change it. Let's do it next week. Things of that nature happen all the time. So it's not just about the technician 
being on site. It's also about the prep work that goes before the technician gets into into a location to actually do the job. So you want to make sure that you run the numbers internally. Make sure you understand your capacity. Make sure how, you know how much time you can spend. At the end of the day, when we run the numbers for the strategy, we want to have a clear understanding that the goal we need to achieve is achievable without interfering with our efforts to grow the business. That's the main thing. Now, I can't really tell you, oh, you got you to spend an hour each week to get the job done. It's every customer is different. Every end user is going to react differently to our approach to communicate, to convey the message. So it's it's more of a trial and error thing. And, and, and really, there isn't a one size fits all. And most of what I'm talking about today, it's really about getting you, giving you a little bit of guidance as to how you should think about the approach. Um, there's only one step, and you'll notice later on, where we're actually talking numbers and, and talking some uh, more concrete ideas. So now that I realize I've, uh, as a dealer, I've come together, my team, I understand, okay, we, on a, on a regular week, we do this amount of work. If we can, we can squeeze out a couple hours a week to do extra, you know, calling people up or emailing or, or reassessing, reevaluating where we are with a sunset strategy. I can spare a technician to do eight hours worth of work, maybe a month, maybe an hour, two hours a week. So I have that in my pocket. Now I know how much I can handle. Now I need to understand how many units um, I need to replace. So I want to make sure that I get an accurate report. Now, again, whether it's TailGuard, whether it's any other vendor communicator out there that you, that you currently have, um, you need to make sure that you get a report. Um, now, it's also, the report will actually, obviously, it, it'll assist you, it'll help you in understanding how many 3G and CDMA units you have, but there's more to it that you can do with that report. Um, you know, it's not every day that you get to look a report, at, at a report um, and you really have to more on a, on a consistent basis, keep looking at that report and seeing change. It's, it's not that often that it happens, at least on the communicator side. Uh, the ideal scenario would be you install a unit, it works, and you just kind of let it run for its lifetime and you just keep collecting the revenue. So in this case, we're actually looking at the report and we want to make sure that we take the opportunity to reconcile our records with Central Station. Um, just to give you an example, for instance, the spreadsheet that we provide that you'll see here in a minute um, has information uh, related to the subscriber. Uh, TelGuard has a field uh, that we call client account number, and it's a field that generally gets used by our customers to input information about Central Station. It usually gets used for the prefix of the Central Station receiver and the account number just as a, as a point of information, right? It doesn't actually impact how the unit gets, how the unit communicates, that's a separate field, uh, but it helps you in, in keeping track of where your unit is. It gives you another search field. Well, sometimes if you happen to have switched Central Station A to Central Station B, or something happened and, and, and there was a typo in the subscriber name or the address, hey, this may be a good time to just go ahead and review that and, 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 and get it corrected. Um, we'll give you that type of access through telgar.com. So here's a, just a quick example of how easy from the Telgar side we made it for you to get the report um, from previous uh, sunsets. Um, it has been sort of a hassle uh, to get reports, to understand reports. So we just made it a one-click option. Uh, once you log in, you go to the dealer section. Once you're in the dashboard, and from the dealer section, you're just really going to choose the one button, the one option that makes sense, 3G CDMA Sunset Report. Now, in that report, we've also included the 2G units um, just as a fail-safe, right? If, if by any chance there's a 2G unit in there uh, for, for our U.S. folks that didn't get changed out, uh, but we're still getting billed for it, hey, reconcile, get rid of that unit. For our Canadian folks, if it's a 2G unit, that's one you got to look after as, to, uh, as well. It's not just about 3G for Canada. So once you export the report, uh, one of the things I want you to take note here is that we provide you with a registration and an activation date. Two very different dates, uh, but should give you a good insight into what's going on, right? So the registration date is the date that you registered the device, meaning that you created the account with Telgar. Now, registration uh, doesn't mean that the device was actually installed. 
activation date is the date that the unit was powered up and sent its first signal. So in looking at the age of a unit and looking at how long a customer has actually had uh, a unit, you want to always look at the activation date. So we understand the sunsets. We understand that we have different options. We got to take advantage of those sales of those options. Now we know how to run a report on TelGuard. We know how to get our numbers. We know that we have, um, I guess we have, by this time, we have created some kind of internal review of how much work we can handle. Um, and we understand how many units we got to take care of. So we can start building our strategy. Uh, the next step is to really plan to add perceived value. So perceived value is really not how much you pay for something, but how much you feel that something is worth to you for the money you pay. Just to give you a, like a, a super clear example, right? You pay for a phone in 2016 versus you paying for a phone in 2018. You may have paid the same amount of money for the same exact phone, uh, but the fact that one of those phones has lasted you from 2016 to now four years versus the other phone lasted you two years and they both broke at the same time, you're going to have higher perceived value from the phone that lasted you four years. So you're going to be a lot happier replacing it than you are with a phone that only lasted you two years because perhaps you were looking to keep it a little bit longer. Same thing with a car, right? Take the car is probably a better example. If a car lasts you a lot longer, you have a better perceived value. Oh yeah, Toyota, Honda, that's a brand of trust. Oh, Ford, that's my brand. Why? Because you had a perceived value of it, regardless of how much you paid for it, that the value you got out of that vehicle was higher than what you paid for or was in line with what you paid for. Well, we want to make sure that as we make these calls out to customers, we are offering a higher perceived value for what they're getting. So ultimately, we know that our goal is to replace that device. We need to get rid of that 2G, 3G, or CDMA device and replace it with an LTE unit. Customers are not going to see it that way. Customers are not going to see it as a necessary evil. They're going to see it as a hassle. They're going to see it as something that, oh, you are calling me to really make me spend more money or make me spend more time or just I got to allocate somebody to let you in now. It, this is so frustrating, right? So we want to make sure that when we contact the customers, we try to add perceived value. We had to add system inspections, upgrade of services, anything that would make it seem as if we're not just there for this specific issue, but hey, well, we're there, we're gonna do all these other things. We're gonna go ahead and do inspections. Something, for instance, in the commercial fire space, anytime we change any hardware, we have to do things of this nature anyway. So let's go ahead and, and publicly advertise the fact that this is going to you know, uh, fully inspect the entire system or inspect a section of it. Um, let's make sure that we transmit the message of you're getting more than just an LTE radio you're getting something a little bit extra. Now, the concept of upselling is also something that, that we wanna keep in mind, right? So yes, we wanna make the customer feel comfortable, but if we see the opportunity to also upsell on the commercial space, maybe we have somebody that's using a TG7FS unit as a backup, as a secondary line up for cellular, hey, maybe it's an opportunity to go ahead and sell them on the Soul Pass solution right away. Um, on the residential space, we have a TG1 Express unit, uh, that's been working specifically for signal forwarding. Maybe now it's the time to uh, sell them on remote arming and disarming, which is available with the TG1 Express. So it's it, it's a matter of figuring out if there's an opportunity there. Now, um, I do want to be cautious with it um, because just in interactions with customers and with end users, the concept of upselling needs to be paired up with empathy, right? upselling with empathy. We understand that this is not a customer calling us because they want an extra service. This is us reaching out to the customers because we need to do some technology change. So a customer is not gonna be super welcome, open arms to, hey, yeah, I can spend more money on you. I can give you a little bit extra. Um, so we wanna make sure that we, we understand where we stand with a customer. We understand who the customer is and find the opportunities for upselling with uh, uh with the understanding of where they are also uh as we as we're all pretty much aware and you can see the background here uh, some of us are working sometimes from home sometimes from the office 
it has impacted business as well. So we want to keep that in mind as well. Uh, some of the businesses that we're reaching out to uh, may have been impacted by the current situation in some way, right? So we want to make sure that we understand the business that we're reaching out to uh, when we do the upsell. So some of the things that you can begin to offer, just as an example, you know, complimentary battery checks, panel sensor checks, things of that nature, things that wouldn't take your technician but a few extra minutes to do. Uh, but on paper, or the value of it, can be uh, extremely heightened to say like, hey, yeah, you're just getting a little something extra for letting us into your house to do this. Overall system test, system checks, uh, maybe pair something up with a with a with uh, an inspection. Maybe that's something that you can do. Maybe drop off new yard signs, new window clings. Yeah, it, ser it serves as advertisement to you, but particularly on the residential space, uh, uh, those are, are, are really highly welcome from, from end users, right? So just think of things that you can add as you formulate your strategy, things that you can come to your customers with that will make them think, this is more than just changing out my radio. I'm getting something a little bit extra on top. So we know the sunsets, we know what we have to do, we know that we have the capacity to do it. We've thought about the things that we can offer from a residential, from a commercial perspective. We understand that we need to add perceived value. So now we really got to get to planning um, what do we need to do? How much work do we need to get to or get through each month in order to truly get all our units converted over by the sunset? So the goal is zero units with older technology, whether it's 2G, 3G, CDMA. The goal is to have zero units with older technology by the sunset. Obviously, what we want to do is we want to get ahead of it. We want to try to do as many as we can. But the concept is without interfering with our current business. So one of the things that we want to do, and this is where the numbers finally come in. This is where if you're a math person, if numbers make more sense, this is where it actually just clicks for you right here. And it's the fact that we know how many units we need to replace. We ran the report. We know exactly how many 3G units. We know exactly how many CDMA units we need to replace. We know the date today. We know the date for the sunset. So doing a little math, we know how many months we have from here until the sunset. So we have those two points of data. So now we do a little bit of math. Um, the, the example that I show you is for a small dealer. So we have 65 units, 65 units that need to be replaced. 58 of them are AT&T, seven are Verizon. So doing a little bit of the math, we have 20 months until the AT&T sunset, 30 months until Verizon sunset. Numbers a little rounded up to make it easier. So we know 20 months for AT&T, I got to deal with 58 units. My math, doing my math, it turns out that I got to hit 2.9 units every month to be able to say that by February of 2022, I went ahead and took care of all my units, which basically means that every month I have a goal of at least three units that need to be replaced, need to be replaced, not reached out to, not contacted three customers, but are replaced three units every month in order to stay on track. Um, for Verizon, it's a, it's a lot lower number. So we got seven units in 30 months, comes out to 0 0.2. So we're looking at one unit every five months, right? So that's our goal, that's our target. That's That would be the, the, the baseline that we have to try to surpass, but always try to never fall under. Now, who do we contact first? We know what we have to do. We know how many units we have to hit. We understand that there's, you know, there, there, there's an age to a customer. Not to the customer itself, but to the to the account, to the activation. So we want to make sure that we keep the perceived value concept at the forefront, right? So when I gave you the example of the cell phone or the car you know, you are perceiving bigger value out of the thing that you spend more time with that lasted you the longest. So in general, uh, the concept is we want to tackle the units that have been out in the field the longest. We want to make sure based on the activation date that we go ahead and tackle those units. So looking at the activation date, simple Excel, you filter it out, you sort it by uh, uh, oldest to newest, and you're gonna be able to get your baseline for the units that you need to tackle first 
all the way down to the newest units, which would be the ones you would tackle towards the end. This would be in an ideal world. In an ideal world, everything would fall in line, nothing would go wrong, you'd be able to get your three units every time, every month, and you'd be able to get to zero before the sunset without anybody complaining, without anybody giving you headaches because their units uh, stopped communicating or anything along those lines. So we know what we want to achieve in an ideal world, but we don't live in an ideal world, right? We don't live in an ideal world. In an ideal world, I would contact three customers and I would have my three appointments set up right away. That does not happen. Now, one of the things that we get asked, uh, uh, at least from the marketing side a little bit, is, you know, so what's the best strategy to contact customers? And I'll be the first to tell you, I don't know. I don't know the best strategy for contacting your customers because I don't really deal directly with your customers. I don't deal with your end users. I didn't bring them on board. I don't know the level of communication that you have. I know that some of my customers, some of my smaller customers, for instance, go as far as texting with their customers back and forth. Um, they have that level of relationship. I know that some of our biggest customers do an initial, uh, uh, initial, uh, you know, snail mail campaign for things where they do invoice stuff first and then gradually move on to emails and phone calls and et cetera. I have some customers that actually just everything do, they do everything digitally. So the strategy of contacting customers is something that once again, you got to internalize, understand who your customers are. You know your customers better than anybody else. No one can tell you how to reach out to your own customers. So I will not tell you how to reach out to your own customers. The only thing that I will say is understand what works for you. And when it comes down to acting on the plan, when it comes down to actually doing it, be ready to adapt. So act on the plan and prepare to adapt is key. Use the available tools to minimize the time spent in the field, right? So. We went ahead and, and, and created this, this, this magical plan. We know we got to tackle three at and units a month. We have the exact activation dates. So we know that we know who are the customers that have had their unit, the 3G units the longest. So we're going to go ahead and call those guys first. All right, bingo. Three calls or three texts or three emails, three appointments made. Well, we made, we made, we made the pitch, right? The thing that we still have to keep in mind is that number one, for the customer, the more time we spend at their house, the more inconvenient it is. The more time we spend at the business uh, or the building, the more inconvenient it is. Also on our side, the more time we spend is the more money it costs us, right? Because that technician could be going and doing something else at the same time. So we wanna make sure that we utilize the tools that are available to us. I know that from telgar.com, and I'm imagining you may have similar concepts uh, across the board for other vendors, but I know with Telgar, we, 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 we took to heart the fact that we wanna minimize time spent on site. So available tools. Number one, we have the telgar.com website that gives you a very simple and straightforward replacement strategy. TG Tools, if you're not familiar with the app, uh, it's an Android or iOS app that is essentially I would say a skeleton version of Telgar.com. So with Telgar.com, you can run reports, you can do all kinds of things. With Telgar tools, you can do very basic things like register a unit and swap or replace a unit. So it's, it's a handy tool for your technicians to no longer have to call back into the office for somebody to uh, you know, get on a computer and do the a registration or, or do a swap or even them having to pull out a laptop, connect to the internet and do the whole thing. They can actually just do it from their phone. So it's a nice tool that allows you to, again, save time on location. And just to give you an example of, of the replacement, uh, um, I guess, feature that we have for subscribers, again, you know, through the years that we've been in the industry and, and kind of going through the sunset, one of the things that we've figured out is we want to make it as easy as possible. So look at the subscriber, you find the right subscriber. Uh, I will say, take any opportunity. If you have the time to review, make sure everything checks out the way that it's supposed to be. Take advantage to clear any, any typos or anything that may be wrong. You go to the device details section and you do not deactivate. You do not detach. I just wanna make sure we have that clear. You don't deactivate, you don't detach because what you're gonna do is you're gonna replace it with another unit. And by using the replace feature, you're essentially inputting the new serial number for the TG7 UBL board or the new TG1 Express or the new TG4. And 
what this feature allows you to do is it allows you to take the programming that was already set on that old unit, on the 3G or 2G unit, and it'll bring it and reprogram the new LTE unit when it comes active, right? So the thought process is if the old unit was working fine and the only thing that is wrong with it is that it has antiquated technology, hopping the new LTE board in will take all those same features that have been working for the past couple of years, for however long you had it, and it'll bring them into the LTE radio. So it makes things a lot easier. It's as soon as the unit, the new board activates, all the programming takes over, takes place, and you maintain that history, that alarm history that you had with this device uh, from before. So now, the same, the same feature is also available through the Telgar Tools app. Uh, it's just, um, less uh, user interface, less graphical stuff, right? So you wanna also use upgrade boards when possible. Uh, again, I kind of cover the TG7 UBL a little bit. Um, and, and this is basically what a TG7 UBL uh, replacement or installation looks like. You're gonna go to your TG7 product, whether it's a Berg or a fire system in this case, um, and you're not going to remove the wires. You're just gonna pop off the terminal blocks pop off the terminal blocks, pop off the connection for the RJ, remove the antenna. That's a key one, remove the antenna. Pop off the old board, take the new board out of the box and put it back in. Um, and then do the same thing that you did before, just in reverse. Pop the terminal blocks back where they belong and go through the activation. Um, the one thing that I wanna make sure we emphasize here though, um, it's the antenna. The antenna is different. The antenna is an LTE antenna that will come with a TG7 UBL, and it's a different antenna than what was used for 3G or CDMA. And the reason why I emphasize it is because a lot of the times, particularly in a commercial application where we have an internal, an external antenna, or or maybe we just have the same antenna but it's extended with a 12 feet of cable to come with that product, um, sometimes we seem to forget that the antenna needs to be replaced as well. And I want to make sure that we convey this message to our technicians that you need to make sure that you check that antenna, check that antenna and replace it. Replace it with an LTE antenna or if it's an external or a high gain antenna, it needs to be replaced with an equivalent. Um, this gets a little tricky because 3G and LTE do share some frequencies, right? And if you replace just the board, there's a very good chance that that LTE board will communicate. It'll still communicate uh, but you may encounter maybe lower signal strength that you could possibly get with an LTE only band. Um, so you may not have the diversity that you would get with LTE, right? With LTE getting three different bands, maybe you're reducing it to just one. Um, so we want to make sure that you take care of the antenna to avoid future issues. Um, again, Every 7UBL is gonna come with its own antenna. Every LTE product is gonna come with its own antenna. Our accessories have been transitioned over to LTE for a couple of years now. Um, so you should be able to find those to distribution as well. So it's, it's great to have a strategy. It's great to know what we wanna accomplish. It's great to have the numbers, have the list, have everything sequentially sectioned so that we can we know we can go in order. Uh, but in this scenario, and, and particularly when it comes to Sunsix, we need to make sure that we're ready to adapt. We need to adapt to customer response first and foremost. Um, you know, I'll put I'll put forth a scenario of calling three people and getting three appointments. That's not gonna happen. I mean, maybe, maybe you're one of the lucky ones that can get that going every month. But generally speaking, that's not going to happen. It's going to be a couple of calls. It's going to be a few emails. Uh, even then, you may not get a response right away. So um, I would say take the first couple of months of you enacted, acting on your strategy to go a little bit overboard, right? You know you want three. To, you want, know your goals to set up three. Let's go ahead and maybe call 10 people. Reach out to 15 people. Send that mass initial uh, uh, invoice uh, stuffer. And let's let's gauge the type of response that we get. So the first couple of months are more of a trial and trial and error situation, right? Let's see how many people I reach out to over the phone or via text, and how many responses I get. And out of those responses, how many appointments I can actually get. So based on those numbers, 
you can actually go ahead and figure out, okay, so this is the way it worked in July, in August, in September. Okay, so by October, I should be able to have a, a fairly good number uh, in mind. Knowing November and December, the way they work, because we know Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, maybe my expectations for results are a little bit lower. So I'm gonna go ahead and increase the number of calls that I make or the number of emails that I send, right? The concept is, you have a goal in mind, you have numbers, you know what you're expecting, but you have to reassess. You always have to adjust. On a monthly basis, uh, I would expect everyone that is using our strategy to run the numbers again. Take a look at what they have left. Do the math again. I have 18 months left now. I have 50 units. I gotta do the math and figure out, well, maybe I used to have to only have three units. Now I gotta bump it up to four. I gotta speed it up a little bit. The thing that we want to make sure that we don't do is fall um, fall behind on our track, right? Now, customer response, it, it's easy to understand. Uh, and and to a certain extent, we can predict, right? Take a couple of months to do your trial. Um, and, and for the most part, you can get a good sense of what works and what doesn't work and kind of adjust. A change in environment, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit trickier. Um, there are situations that may cause signals to degrade in unexpected ways in different areas. Um, just to give you a, an example, I guess it's a, a clearer example. Let's just say a hurricane hits a specific city or, or, or a big tornado or, or a, a thunderstorm or something that knocks off a few towers in a specific area that you cover where you have, when you have 10 or 15 units, right? Um, what's gonna happen is chances are AT&T or Verizon are gonna get to work right away. They're gonna try to fix the towers, they're gonna reallocate bandwidth, try to cover with the other towers, they're gonna you know, increase transmit power for nearby towers so they can, so customers in those areas with the knockdown towers can get at least a little bit of signal. Um, so they're gonna try to adjust and eventually what they're gonna do is they're gonna replace those towers or repair those towers, right? Now, put yourself in the shoes of an AT&T or, or, a, or a Verizon, a business person, right? Um, I know that 3G and CDMA, it's gonna sunset in 2022. Do I really want to make uh, an investment in getting those towers back up and functional and spend money on technology that I know is going to die, that I know that I am going to kill actually uh, by 2022? Or do I want to enhance those towers, use the same money, probably less, to enhance those towers to be LTE, have more bandwidth for those LTE customers and maybe get it ready for 5G. Taking the opportunity that was presented in front of me to do a conversion earlier than maybe I would have expected to happen in that city. Um, you know, I'm a business person. I'm gonna take a look at the numbers. I look at the fact that A, 3G and, and, and CDMA, I'm going to kill it in a couple of years. And B, um, 99, plus percent of my customers are gonna be using the LTE network, gonna be smartphone users, gonna be tablet users. So let's cater to those high uh, data consumption customers, make them happy. Um, so that is something that could unexpectedly happen. That is something that could possibly uh, sort of deviate you from your plan, right? So, so far our strategy was, let's take a look, oldest to newest, start calling them up, tackling. Now, once you start, once you start getting a sense of there's been, a, a, I guess, a, a natural disaster or something happening, um, or you're, it doesn't even have to be that that drastic, you start getting customer complaints from building A is A, it's beeping on me. Building B is beeping like, hey, I can't remote arm my system, and it happens to a couple of customers, three customers, four customers in the same area. I encourage you to call tech call tech support at any time. See if we have any information from the network regarding a specific city, specific state. Now, I will say that things are happening all the time. Transitions, conversions from one technology to the other, shutting things down, towers being down, that happens all the time, every minute, every second of every day. So we don't get that direct information from AT&T, from Verizon, but we can be your advocates. We can take a look at our population, right? Population that perhaps you don't have access to, but we can we can ping other units, see if other units are behaving in the same area, the same as yours are. 
trying to figure out if there's a sense for, oh, that city may be impacted by something. Let me reach out to AT&T. Let me reach out to Verizon, try to get confirmation. But even if we don't get confirmation, um, the proof is in the pudding. We already have other units besides yours that you don't have access to, but we as Telgard can go ahead and, and figure out if they're responding as well. Um, we can give you a better sense of, you know what, maybe there's something going on in that city for the 3G units. Now, what does that mean to you? Once again, you have to adapt. You have to reassess, and maybe instead of going for older to newer, you start tackling that city. You take a look at the report again, you filter by city, you filter by zip code, you filter by the location. Telgar.com has a nice um, map overlay of your units that you can get to from the subscriber search. And it allows you to see geographically where your units are based on the information you provided for the address of each subscriber. So figure out now that you know that there's an event going on in the city, how we switch the strategy from oldest to newest, now we're doing it by city because we know that that city is currently impacted. And the quicker we can get to those guys uh, as, part of our, as, as part of our strategy, the better it will be for us as a, as a business. So use the sensor, sensor report, use all the tools available to you. Now, again, nothing that I have said really is anything innovative or anything new. It's, it's more along the lines of what we have heard over the years. Telgar has been in the business since 1986, so we've seen it all, we've been through it all. Uh, I started with the company in 2007, so I've been through the 2008 and the 2016 sunsets. Um, the worst thing that you can do is believe that nothing will happen until the sunset. That is the absolute worst. So if, if you get anything out of, uh, out of this whole webinar, really, is the fact that you don't need to wait. You have to act now, but you need to be willing to adapt to what happens. Um, so with that, Scott, I don't know if we have any questions from our audience. Yes, great job on the presentation, Daniel. We do have a couple of questions that came in. Uh, first one I have is, uh, do we know what areas of the country will be sunsetting first so we can be prepared with updated equipment for the end user so we're not caught off guard? Um, so the carriers don't necessarily like to give that information out. Um, and, and this is one of those things that um, I really I really wish that I could just let everybody listen to one of the calls that we have with carriers at, at times. Um, and, and I can understand from their point of view, right? Um, if things change, if, if plans change and they have to quickly adjust, you know, that, so that city's not going to happen. Let's go ahead and move on to another one, um, you know, to, to keep that updated. Uh, in real time, it, it's kind of a headache for them. Um, so we don't generally have that information available now when it's a big enough, very impactful uh, event. Um, we have sent out a few notifications out in the past. Um, so if you are not currently on our notification list, uh, I would encourage you to reach out to your salesperson, to your sales representative, and sign up for the uh, technical event notification list, right? So this is a list that we have for customers. And a lot of the times the people that sign up for telgar.com uh, are not really the people that would need to, at least from your business, right? That would need to be aware of some of the uh, some of the happenings, I guess, on, on the network side. Um, so if you have any other email addresses that you would like us to reach out to whenever there's a Verizon event or an AT&T event that we're aware of, reach out to your sales representative and they can get you signed up with us. Thanks, Daniel. Let's see, next question we have, uh, got a couple of questions about if the presentation will be sent out after the call. Uh, so we'll actually are going to post this video from the webinar to our YouTube channel. Um, we're gonna post that uh, by Monday. So keep an eye out for it there. And uh, uh, remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, next question we have, uh, when 5G comes around, um, and LTE is ready to go, uh, or will we need to replace LTE as, as well? So I think when 5G comes around, will LTE technology be ready to go, or will we need to replace it as well is the question. All right, so um, generally speaking, um, and, and, and I, I guess it's, it's easier to think of it in, as a business, how many technologies can I support at, one, at, any, at any given time? Um, over the course of the past 30 years, you know, as, as cellular has evolved, 
it's generally been the case of two main technologies sort of at any given time, right? So right now we're dealing with 3G, let's just say AT&T, 3G, LTE, and bringing in 5G, right? So as 5G is kind of getting deeper into the picture, it's kind of propagating more in the trial runs and, and, and phones are now, you know, coming out with 5G technology, uh, we're seeing 3G go away. The same thing, you know, that happened in 2016, LTE was becoming mainstream. So at that point, AT&T decided, okay, now LTE is mainstream, 3G is uh, is, is pretty good, let's go ahead and uh, remove the 2G service. So generally speaking, from a business perspective, they like to keep two technologies at any given time, right? Um, now, as far as whether the LTE units will need to be, uh, you know, turned off or will need to be replaced, um, it really comes down to when the networks make the determination that LTE needs to go away, right? So if they follow this trend of two technologies always being available, always being prevalent, uh, we may need to wait until the next technology above 5G, I guess you can call it 6G, 5G plus, whatever they decide to call it, um, comes around before we see LTE completely fade away. So uh, from our perspective, there isn't any sort of announced LTE date um, at all, um, but we do know that it eventually it will go away. But based on the trends that we see of two technologies, I don't think there's anything we have to fear anytime soon. Excellent. Um, another question we have is, uh, how can I find the Telguard Tools app? It should be uh, on the Apple Store or the Play Store under, if you just search for Telguard, um, it would be one of the uh, one of the only three apps I believe we have. Uh, Scott, maybe we, what we can do is we can send everybody uh, uh, links to the app. If we have the email information for everybody on the call, is that possible? Yes, we could do that. Sure. Yeah, that might be an easier way to get it to you. Absolutely. All right, sounds good. All right, that's the last of the questions that we have. Thanks everyone for joining our webinar as discussing the five steps to a successful 2G, 3G, and CDMA sunset. Uh, Daniel, thanks for presenting. If you'd like to learn more, you can check us out on telguard.com. As Daniel mentioned earlier, we do have a specific page for the sunset, telguard.com forward slash sunset. And if you want to talk, you want to talk to your sales rep, best way to reach them is at 800-229-2326, option five. Thanks again, everybody, for joining the call. We'll post this video later on our YouTube channel and send you the link out for the Telgard Tools app. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody. Thanks.